Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large. Coming at you this uh, second week of December, this is December 10th, that this episode is airing, which, by the way, is the day before my birthday. So you all can wish me a happy birthday this weekend. Um, I wanted to mention, of course, that this uh, podcast is brought to you on iTunes, on Stitcher, Google Play, as well as here on YouTube, uh, which includes a video. And uh, this week, we actually have a very uh, great, uh, we have a great episode for you. This week, we are going to talk with Rachel Bernstein, old friend of mine, um, who is a family and relationship counselor in uh, Los Angeles and is also a cult recovery counselor and uh, has been doing that for over two decades. Very experienced, has helped hundreds and hundreds of people in getting out of destructive cult situations. And as a board certified and licensed therapist, I wanted to talk to her this week about something broader than just the subject of cults or destructive cults, which of course we've, you know, always got on the brain here. Um, And I wanted to talk about, you know, relationships and I wanted to talk about narcissism and psychopathy or psychopaths and sociopathy or sociopaths. Because these words are used interchangeably a lot, and that is an error to do that. There is overlap. The Venn diagram on these three things do cross each other, and there are similar traits and characteristics from one to the next. But um, there are also differences, and there are things you can recognize in people that differentiate these these things. And as it turns out, it's very important to know the differences, because Um, Some actions, some aspects of these things are treatable and some are not uh, because where, you know, the root cause of these conditions is different from one to the next. So we are going to talk about that with Rachel. I hope you guys uh, will uh, enjoy this as much as I think I'm going to. So here we go. Here is Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Thanks for being on my show again. Sure. My pleasure, as always. (laughs) Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm, I've got earphones on this time because I've always been getting feedback from my, from my, when I'm, you know, interviewing people. So I got these things sticking out of my ears this time. Um, so, okay, well, let's get to it. I wanted to talk about, um, this for a long time now, actually. And so I'm glad we're finally doing this. You are somebody who's actually trained. You're a clinical therapist. You're, you're board certified. You know, you've been doing this for a long time. And this is above and beyond just the, the, the subject matter of, of cults. I want to talk about something even broader than that, which is um, there are these three words that are used to describe different mental states that people have. And I wanted to kind of talk to, you know, you as a professional about what those states actually are and put some delineation into this and some and some definition because i thought it would be useful for everybody who listens to my show you know and who is interested in this stuff at a more of a level than just the social yeah he's a psycho sort of thing right and those words of course are you know um narcissist and uh psychotic right and sociopath because Mm -hmm. these are you know these are these are actual words that have real clinical meanings as far as I know, as I understand it, but we don't necessarily, the the average Joe doesn't necessarily bust out the DSM every time he uses these terms on Facebook or something, you know, and I thought it might be useful and informative to, to talk about this. You know, what do you, what do you think? Uh, I agree. I think that these terms have become very popular and some of them actually were created by popular culture rather than being originally clinical. But as with many things, things that are sometimes started in society and in popular culture find their way into clinical and psychological realms uh, because it turns out that there really was a need to have kind of a um, differential diagnosis, kind of parse out Mm -hmm. the differences between these different kinds of um, personalities and issues and what they call the symptom picture in each diagnosis. Okay. Uh, That's the combination of different symptoms that you find um, for each of these diagnoses. So 
narcissism is getting talked about a lot, but what's so fascinating about that is that people are really learning a lot about how they've been affected in their lives by narcissists, not realizing that that was, that's what happens when you deal with a narcissist. Like, oh yeah, that actually happened to me too. Ex almost in an entirely identical way to other people who were mistreated or used or abused or controlled by narcissists. Um, and narcissistic personality disorder is its own diagnosis. Um, and then you have the, you know, sociopath and psychopath mm -hmm. diagnoses, which mm -hmm. really fall under um, the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis. Okay. Um, and they're different from each other, and they're different from narcissism, but here's right. where it gets tricky. There's overlay with all of them, yeah. um, right? Because yeah. they are personalities that uh, behave differently in the world than a lot of other people, but very similar to each other. Um, and so, yeah, we probably should go over what the distinct differences are. Yeah, I'd really like to do that. Um, okay. So maybe, what do you think, should we start with narcissism? Sure. Is that a good place to start? Yeah. Okay. Narcissism is a good place to start. Oh. Uh, and a narcissist would appreciate that you started with narcissism. <laughs> good, good. Well, you know, that's, uh, you know, excellent. Because it's the best and most important to the narcissist, like well, everything else. Exactly. Um, what's interesting about narcissism is that narcissists would not call themselves narcissists. Mm -hmm. um, and they usually don't go for help with it because they don't realize they have it. Um, part of the disorder is that they feel that they're not the source of the problem. Mm. So there's no reason to go for therapy. If, well, it's not me. It's them. It's not it's right. Them. Exactly. It's always them. Right. right. And if they didn't just listen to me, and agree with me, mm -hmm. and do what I say, then we wouldn't be having this problem. Right. You know. Right. So, so what's their motivation to want to go for help? Um, right. They'll usually bring in their husband, wife, whomever else. Um, as the source of the problem, as what we call the IP, the identified patient. Uh, but any therapist worth his or her salt would be able to tell in the first minute that that IP, the identified patient, is not the source of the problem. Mm. Um, and so narcissists have this general sense that they are very deserving, more deserving than anyone else, um, of adoration, um, of needing to be the best and the brightest, the smartest one in the room, um, or the best looking. They're usually very polished, um, and they command the room, and they have a sort of stage presence uh, in a way that many people find very captivating. Hmm. So um, you'll find that people who get sucked into the vortex that's created by a narcissist will often say, I found them electrifying. I just was drawn in and I felt specially chosen by them because I got the sense that they could have been with anyone, but they chose to be with me. Right. Um, and so there's this charisma that is kind of addictive. And it also is there to mask a lot of what's happening inside. And, uh, and, and what is happening inside? What is the deal with this? I mean, narcissism, narcissism you know, is, is uh, well, the word goes back to what? That Greek nar narcissus, nar narcissus, narcissus or something? The uh -huh. person who was staring at his reflection in the pool until he died or something because that was, because he thought he was so beautiful or something. He was this beautiful guy. Right, he was captivated by his own reflection to his own detriment. So I think right. that that's, that's where it certainly that comes from and that's woven into the life of a narcissist. Um, they're captivated by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but 
what is fascinating when you get to know a narcissist is that they are usually very hollow on the inside. They don't really have this kind of complete self on the inside where they, well, I feel like someone who is sort of a complete self mm -hmm. can walk through the world with what I like to call sort of quiet confidence. They don't have to be boastful. They don't have to overcompensate mm. um, for a feeling of emptiness. They don't need adoration because they feel fine. You know, they don't need to be the first one in line or the smartest or whatever. Um, they are not coming from an empty and insecure place. But narcissists are coming from an empty and insecure place and they overcompensate. Mm. Not just compensate, but overcompensate mm. by um, needing to have everyone sit at their feet or needing to be constantly reminded um, of all of their skills and talents or sexiness or whatever it is that they're needing. Um, but what is also very tricky about dealing with a narcissist is that they start back emotionally at square one every day. It's like they get, a, there's like a reset button on the inside hmm. where no matter how much you fed them emotionally, no matter how much reassurance and adoration uh, you gave them, they need it all over again starting the next day. Oh, okay. Okay. And they won't remember all that you did for them. It doesn't count anymore. And they right. won't remember or even care about the sacrifices you've already made for them. So it's um, sort of the epitome of the what have you done for me lately thing. Right. And nothing is the answer, right? right? <laughs> and even though, even though the other people are like exhausted, right? Their hair is like all over the place. They haven't slept. They've been running around. They've been trying to do everything just on time so they don't get yelled at. They've been... Um, needing to become this perfect person and sort of craft themselves to make this other, the narcissist in their life happy. Um, and they haven't taken care of their own needs in a very long time. Um, and still, the narcissist will have zero memory, zero sense of reflection about that you really are a devoted friend or that you really have already made all these sacrifices or you've said goodbye to all of your friends and family in order to be totally devoted to this person and still it's not enough it's never enough yeah they just need more and more and more yeah and and now this is relationship family friends like this is anybody relationship family friends boss um anyone yeah. Okay. I mean, when so um, when the narcissist is in a junior position to a boss, they'll still be putting this on the boss. Um, what they will do is they'll be clever about um, needing. They're not going to want to be in a junior position because mm -hmm. part of what goes along with being a narcissist is feeling entitled. Okay. So the only reason that boss is the boss is because you haven't taken their job yet. Um, so, uh, because you're really the one who's deserving of it, not them. Right. So narcissists will very often um, work on the coworkers and work on people just above them to defame the boss, to make them see that that person really shouldn't be in that position, but that they should. Okay. Um, and sometimes they'll make up stories, false accusations, whatever else, in order to move up the ranks. Um, usually they kind of play dirty tricks in order to get where they want to go and they'll make up stories or they'll do gaslighting, which we should um, probably talk about. Yeah, right. Um, a in term order to that make... I'm thinking is being used a little incorrectly these days in some circumstances I've been seeing. So yeah, uh, I, I would like to talk about that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they will work on people mentally to make them somehow think that um, something is wrong with them. Um, you know, they can make people feel that they're going crazy. And they love the power of it. They just love the power. Okay. Um, so, yeah. 
So now, um, so okay, so let's let's dive into that gaslighting real fast because it is related to what you just said. So, gaslighting specifically, and I think we've talked about this before, uh, yeah. is from that movie Gaslight. That's that's right. where it comes. That's where the term comes from. Yeah. And and it's yeah. this idea of doing something to another person mm -hmm. purposefully to mm -hmm. make th to get them off their game, to get them off, to throw them off, to make them feel like they have done something wrong or they don't or they're a little bit crazy or they're a little bit like whoa i like you know you like for example um you know a, a, a i don't know stupid example but like you know a red ball rolls in the room and then an hour later you know the the, the narcissist guy might say uh you know did you see that blue ball that rolled in the room and the guy uh -huh. goes no it was red and he goes oh no it was blue it was absolutely mm -hmm. blue. No, it wasn't red. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. You know, I mean, that's a stupid example, but something that will throw the person off and yeah. doubt, doubt their, doubt, end up doubting themselves, doubting their own certainty, doubting what they know, because this other person is so insistent on or has set up a circumstance that makes it look like what they know is wrong or what they remember mm -hmm. is wrong. Is that, is that a good Right. So that is that is one piece of it that is so insidious mm -hmm. um, to make people feel that they're not in control of their own minds anymore and mm -hmm. they're not in control of their own senses anymore um, is literally crazy making. Right. Um, and so people will feel so disoriented and they will be afraid to go out in the world because they can't trust what they're seeing and they can't trust the information that they're bringing in through their eyes and ears and um and it it can make people feel very much off kilter what gaslighting can also be used for is not only making the person feel like they're going crazy but having other people see them as crazy oh, okay um, okay like, so, like how would that work so for example um when I mean, I, I, I use an example from a group that I, you know, that used to play tricks on people where they would um, take, go into their um, places of business and move things around. So then they would bring people into that person's office knowing that they had moved some of their things around. The person didn't know, though, that someone had been in there. And the other people who they brought into the office also didn't know. And here you have this person who's really bright and capable is saying, Wait, I, I, but I, I thought I left, my, didn't I leave my glasses? I just put them down. My glasses were, did anyone see my glasses? And people are like, really, you know, and they're starting to notice that this person looks like they're sort of slowly losing their mind. And mm -hmm. it makes other people wonder about them, too. Right. So you then not only feel like you're going crazy and start to worry about yourself, you then lose the credibility of the people around you. And then the narcissist or the person trying to control you um, will capitalize on that and will s sort of swoop in to be the person you then need to be dependent upon mm. because you're losing your mind. Right, right. right? Oh, here's and your glasses they, right here, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember putting them there. Well, clearly, because they were right over here, so you must have. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. And, and you know, I, as you know, um, when you're dealing with cultic groups, they'll flat out say, we never did, we never did that, we never said that, mm -hmm. but you know they did, and right. you know, you heard it, and it's in writing. No, someone just, that must have been a typo, or if someone made that up, um, that's your imagination. I mean, all of it is set up, sort of, it's like gaslighting en masse. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like something's wrong with you. Okay, so this is one of the key tools, then, that a narcissist will use in getting cowing people around them and getting people under their control around them. Yeah. So is it, so it, the thing about this narcissism then that is so dangerous is that it's not just about self-aggrandizement. It's not just about ego feeding. It is about lessening other people around them so that they can feel bigger, better, stronger, faster than everybody else. 
they'll take active steps, knowing calculated active steps to right. push people around them down so right. that they seem better than they really are. Is that, is that yeah. accurate? It, exactly. So I picture it as a narcissist raising himself up uh, by stepping on the backs of others. Okay. Okay. The only power a narcissist has is the power that he takes away from other people. Okay. Now that's an important point because we're not talking about a, um, you know, a Jesse Owens or a, you know, like, like, like a like a superb stellar athlete or or administrator or whatever, and somebody who really excels at their field mm -hmm. is someone who really has a skill set that put them there, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not just somebody who's liked or admired. It's not just somebody who has a better skill set than other people. Mm -hmm. That's not narcissism. Narcissism is this whole other thing. Right. You right. can, uh, you can, it's sort of like a both and situation as opposed to either or, because mm -hmm. you can have people who are wildly talented who are not narcissists and you can have people right. who are wildly talented who are. Okay. It's not so much about their skill level or their talent. It's about the sense of entitlement they start to feel and how that affects how they treat the other people in right. their life. Right. That's, that's what I wanted the to narcissistic. clarify. That's the narcissistic. Yeah. That's Good. the personality part. That's what, that's the disorder. Okay. And, and of course, what, we're, what, what you said earlier is that the reason for that stepping on the backs of others and that need to be pacified and need to be reassured all the time is because no matter how good they are or aren't, they don't feel that they are. They, they need that attention and that adoration and that, that reinforcement of their ego. It's, it's never enough. And, and so um, the, the visual that I offer for this when I have clients who are dealing with narcissists in their lives and wondering why it's, you know, even though they've reassured them day after day that they're there, they're not going to leave them, that they care about them, that they're the most important people in their lives and it's still not enough. I talk about how the inside of a narcissist is very childlike. Um, and they haven't yet developed kind of a solid sense of themselves. And instead of it being a solid place where, let's say, you or I, if we um, find that we have good character development and then we can feel proud of ourselves in the world and we've achieved certain things and we've made a difference uh, or we've received a compliment or two or three, it goes into a place that feels kind of solid. It gets collected. But a narcissist has something that's much more like a sieve. And right. so it just sort of falls through. Only a couple things catch and everything else is gone. Mm -hmm. And they then will sometimes get very mean because of this. Um, there, is this there is this term called narcissistic injury, mm -hmm. um, which is also part of the disorder. Um, they will take a perceived slight, uh, and anything can be a perceived slight because they need, um, again, for people to always treat them a certain way uh, and say it just the way they want to hear it. You know, their requirements are really very kind of perfectionistic because they're so needy. Um, if there is a perceived slight, then they take that as, it's almost like you attacked them. Um, like you attack their very core, like they're suddenly they feel like you're telling them they're meaningless because that's really how they feel. Mm. And so you then attacked them, even though you didn't, and they attack you back. And because they have to be stronger than you and better than you, they're going to attack you in a greater way than they perceived you attack them. And that's when people are dealing with narcissists, they will suddenly get a barrage of insults, accusations, be screamed at, and they'll have no idea where it, you know, where it came from. Okay. Um, and that's what that's about. Interesting. Okay, now another quality or trait of that disorder that I wanted to address or ask about is, um, is, is a narcissist, is part of the disorder um, violence? Hmm. Uh, not necessarily, but it can be. Oh, it can. It okay. can be, yeah. I mean, they, you know, they have been known to strike out at the people who 
um, unfortunately, oftentimes at partners, spouses, um, sometimes children. Um, okay, so they can they, be physically abusive as part of it. They can be. Usually their, their mode of attack is um, psychological. Um, but yeah, they can be. What, what you'll find is that a narcissist has two selves, an outward persona, sort of a social public persona, mm -hmm. and a private persona. The private persona is an entirely different person. So again, it's uh, head spinning for people who um, are out with them, let's say publicly at a party where they're, you know, kind of reigning supreme and being wonderful and lovely and, and oh, can I help you clean up and whatever else. And as soon as they come home and the door is closed, they'll just launch into an attack mm. on whoever they're with. Um, who they feel like, you know, if they notice that something is out of place or something wasn't done the way they said it needed to be done. Um, and then behind closed doors, if they're going to be prone to violence, that's when they'll do it. They won't do it in public. They won't show that side of themselves. That's also part of the crazy making piece of it for people who are their victims. Right. Because no one believes them. He did that to you, but he's so lovely and he's so kind. He's so gentle. He's such a good hugger. You know, what a, like, so warm. He would never do that. And he helped my mom up and down the stairs, you know, all right. the, like being, being sort of Boy Scout-like or Girl Scout-like. Yeah, yeah, because this, this, this does apply equally to men and yeah. women. Mm, a little more to men, but yes, okay. there are female narcissists. I, well, I was wondering percentages-wise, is, is there a, have surveys been done or has this been looked into? Yeah, it's hard also because they, they're not going to be self-reporting. <laughs> like, right. oh, yeah, I'm a narcissist. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> but they have noticed there are some diagnoses that, are, um, that women get more of. And in this realm, they found it more with men. Although what they are noticing is that sometimes with particular gender differences, diagnoses sometimes play out in different ways. And so they just might not know how to look for it as clearly in women uh, as in men. But for right now, the percentages are more leaning towards uh, more males in this category. Interesting. Okay, fair enough. Well, let's move on because we could spend the rest of the show talking about these guys as, as we have in the past because um, they're certainly fascinating. And I'm sure you get yeah. no shortage of this, you know, coming across that couch behind you. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, so in your right. office yeah. right now, right? But I want to also touch on these other two. So we have, um, you know, psychopathy and we have sociopathy. And these two things I don't think are generally understood. I know I don't have it clearly understood. If somebody was like, okay, what's the difference, Chris? I'd be like, uh, well, you know, I, mm. I, I don't really know exactly. I kind of use the word sociopath when it comes to, you know, people in a group dynamic sort of situation versus a psychopath, which I kind of think is more of a one-on-one -on -one thing. But that's just all in my head. I, I didn't get that from anywhere. So I, what, what are these two things? Okay, and I think the reason that it's not clear is that they're more kind of, um, you know, colloquial terms and not mm -hmm. yet kind of codified in a diagnostic way. Mm -hmm. um, when you are dealing with a sociopath, you often have someone who is um, more isolated, someone who um, is going to be holding a lot of feelings, absorbing a lot of feelings, feeling like an outcast, um, feeling like they don't really fit in anywhere, um, will often um, kind of sequester themselves, be alone for long stretches of time. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and uh, those are the ones who will sometimes, I mean, will do like the school shootings um, mm. when they've been sort of pushed to that point and haven't gotten the help they needed and haven't been given an opportunity to have an alliance with someone where they really feel they have a friend. Sometimes that makes all the difference. It doesn't always turn into something violent, certainly. Um, what you do find more often is the people who are sociopaths will connect with others who are also sociopaths, 
which is not necessarily a healthy alliance because they will sometimes feel safe in each other's company because you know they feel kind of different together mm -hmm. um but what and and then they get to feel understood and safe in each other's company and and not made fun of and not be made to feel different but what they also don't get in those groupings is they don't get a chance to have someone bring them into kind of the mainstream and remind right. them that they can have a place there. They don't have to be so separated off. Um, so, so with a sociopath, yeah, you have someone who feels very deeply and oftentimes is dealing with anger, feeling misunderstood, um, judged. They've often been bullied. Um, they're harboring a lot of feelings, and they oftentimes don't don't get the help that they need. Um, I, the first thing that's coming to mind, of course, with me on this is the two Columbine shooters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Who paired up? I mean, almost everything you said right down the line was, as far as I understand it, those two social outcasts, you know, yeah. not doing well, not a lot of friends, but each other and yeah. sort of united in this idea of us against the world sort of thing and went into, you know, a school shooting situation. And, right. You know, yeah. that, that seems pretty exactly what you're describing there. Yeah, well, I think, you know, and this is a whole other video that I think would be good to touch on the whole, uh, the whole after effect of bullying and what bullying does to people and how mm -hmm. it can create um, kind of a, a sociopathy. Sociopathy is something that they feel is created more situationally and through life experiences than something you're born with. Mm. So it lets me know that if someone had been given a chance to have other experiences that were more positive, then they might not have gone in this way, in this trajectory. So that's, it's sad. It's like they missed opportunities for early intervention. Um, um, so, so this is definitely then something that is probably more um, nurture than nature. So something yes, sort of created. Absolutely. So, okay. Yeah. That's important yeah. to know. And, and what happens too is if you feel that you don't fit in, you don't belong, um, or you've, or not just you feel it, but you've been told it, you know, like you don't belong here, get away from us, or, you know, or you sit down at a lunch table at school and everyone gets up and leaves. I mean, those moments are <clears throat> devastating to people. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the way to being bullied or being bullied consistently and not having anyone come to your defense and feeling completely alone, mm -hmm. you then feel really powerless in the world. And for some people, they then feel they have to get a sense of their power back and they will sometimes do it by taking out and you know and do sort of a revenge killing or um, revenge hurting or will take it out now unfortunately through social media by bullying people you know mm. through their writings uh, through their comments through posting things and getting back in that way I think just because they have never really been able to feel good about themselves. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's definitely a different idea than what I had about that word. So that's that's I've, I've definitely been misusing that word, and uh, and that's good to know. Because, um, like for example, I would I knowing what you've just said, I would never describe David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, that way. He's not you know a person who likes to be alone. He's not a person who has that kind of thing going on. He's, you know, he, he definitely has quite a bit of those narcissistic characteristics that we talked about. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, all yeah. like, yeah, you know, but, yeah. but sociopath would not really be the right word for that man. No, no, you know? but the right word would be the next one that we're going to talk about. Which, yeah, let's we get into uh -huh. this one now, which is the, the psycho, you know, psychopathy, psychopath. Psychopathy or yeah. psychopath, you know, it depends how you're using it, but psychopath is um, is the adjective for it. Psychopathy is you sort of seen as the diagnosis. And again, it's sort of a diagnosis in its beginning forms. It's all sort okay. of being created. Um, so what is a psychopath? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> okay. Um, like this is from a professional now. This isn't like... Oh, from a um, comic book, you know. <laughs> stressful. I have to get it right. <laughs> um, psychopaths scare me. Mm -hmm. 
Narcissists don't scare me. Sociopaths don't scare me. Okay. Um, psychopaths should scare people. Yes. Um, because um, they behave in a very narcissistic way, but without that kind of emptiness inside. It's not coming from an overcompensation. It's actually coming from a disorder that they were born with, where they have no conscience and they have no sense of caring towards anyone else's experience or anyone else's pain. So this is somebody that is that is actually dangerous. I mean, they were. This is not a nurture situation. This is a nature situation. They're born with this sort of disorder where they have this uh, inability to a, a total inability to empathize. Yeah, and what they've noticed now with doing some brain studies is that it actually can come from a disorder that is um, structural in the brain, a neurological issue and mm -hmm. a structural issue having to do with the part of the brain that has to do with empathy, judgment, you know, just um, how you evaluate how to be in this world, that you, even from a young age, um, you notice children... Uh, when another child has fallen down and hurt themselves, children will often go over and try to make nice, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially if that's the way they've been treated if, with their families, with their friends so far. They'll go over and try to make nice. And even the ones who haven't yet been acculturated to do that will look over and will look concerned because they're noticing it. Um, when someone doesn't look over it could be that they have some other kind of disorder that might cause them to not notice people in a social way like people on the autism spectrum um, might not notice certain social behavior but when they are um, kind of helped to see that that's an important piece of being in the world mm -hmm. then they're able to show that then they're able to participate with other people in that way a psychopath um, will not only not care, they might actually enjoy watching it happen. Mm. Because give for them, them pleasure. there's pleasure, there's such an emotional detachment um, that it almost seems a bit like entertainment to them. Mm. Um, and so uh, psychopaths are an interesting breed and luckily it's a very small percentage of the population very small i mean you're talking about you know less than one percent thank goodness really but okay. yeah i mean sometimes it goes up to like three percent but i think that that's a little too much mm -hmm. um because there are just some people who are just not nice <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't right? right or they're called other names um right. but uh um, but they're not psychopaths, um, cause that's, that is when you get into this antisocial personality disorder, mm -hmm. which can run the risk of being very, very dangerous. Mm. Um, so where they're similar to narcissists and different than sociopaths is also how they come across publicly. Psychopaths usually have a very sort of it's much more akin to a narcissist kind of outward polished persona mm -hmm. um they're going to look like everyone else they are kind of hiding in plain sight mm -hmm. um and you don't know that they're doing what they're doing behind closed doors or kind of plotting things um um you know, like the m mass murderers or the serial rapists, you know, those are the, those are the psychopaths. Right. Because these are people who, they, the, I think the thing that's fascinating, horrifying, and intriguing, you know, fascinating and intriguing about this personality type or this disorder is, um, is how... And a, a person who doesn't have this, who does have empathy, who does care, who does have, a, a, you know, an emotional connection with other people, mm -hmm. can't get themselves into the headspace of somebody mm -hmm. who does not care what anyone right. else has to think or say mm -hmm. or feel. Mm -hmm. they, they, it's just not there. It's an emptiness inside where, where other people would have this well of 
feeling or, mm -hmm. you know, empathy, that's really the word, for mm -hmm. others, you know, this ability to sympathize with, this ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see how they're looking at things and therefore maybe I won't do this because they wouldn't like it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or maybe I'll do this because they would like it. I mean, it's both. It runs both ways. The, the psychopath mm -hmm. can't see any of that. Yeah, can't can't, no. can't do that. No. So all no. so anything they're doing to get along with others or put on a facade is all social mannerisms. It's all learning. It's 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 fake. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Wow. And so the other thing that is similar. Uh, from psychopaths to narcissists and kind of different than sociopaths because sociopaths can connect with other sociopaths actually in a meaningful way mm -hmm. uh, because again you know they're kind of the outcasts together um, narcissists don't actually ever have true relationships they okay. don't really love in the same way they don't care in the same way they just need to be fed um, okay. so they will care about you if you are giving them what they need. And as soon as you're not, they don't care about you anymore. It's absolutely superficial, um, and one-sided. Um, a psychopath doesn't have any relationships. A psychopath is someone who operates totally alone in the world. They'll seem like they have friends, and they'll be friendly towards people in an outward way, but they don't actually have any true relationships. Wow. Um, some, in a very rare case, you know, some might be married, but usually they're not. Usually they just go, because they, they don't want anyone to get in their way. Um, and they don't also want to have to care, and they don't know how, uh, and so, it's sort of it's too problematic to have other people in their lives in any kind of way um they don't know how to read people's faces um because they've never learned because they don't care um hmm. yeah it's very it's very interesting it's very interesting huh now as psychopaths we generally tend to think of as uh violent people you know people who commit violence like like that it's like just not a problem mm -hmm. right um, mm -hmm. And whereas, you know, narcissists we mentioned earlier sometimes do, you know, behind closed doors or something. But so how does that, what's, how, where does that fit into these two things? Or does that fit in as a trait? Do, do, are all psychopaths violent or are there psychopaths who do not go there? Oh, there are some psychopaths who... Uh, do not go there, but there, uh, of the three, if you're talking about violence, um, at the top of the pyramid will be psychopaths. Okay. Um, they are the ones who will be um, uh, planning to, again, you know, maybe hurt people en masse or um, be serial killers or serial rapists. Mm -hmm. um, to do poisonings, um, torture. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you'll see it at an early age. I mean, with with psychopaths, you see behavior actually that is alarming at a very young age. Okay. Um, you'll see kids who will purposely hurt other kids or try to get them to like swallow um, the paint thinner. Um, just to see what happens mm. um, because they know it's dangerous and they know you might wind up in the hospital and they're kind of just using you as a guinea pig to kind of test out their theory about what might happen. Mm -hmm. um, they will um, torture animals. Um, and mm -hmm. so you'll start to see that at a, at a very young age. Um, and what they will learn over time is how to hide it better. Right. Right. You know. That's a that's having um, spent a little bit of time, you know, studying serial killers and stuff. That that is a common trait with them is uh, childhood manifestations of, uh, you know, experimenting on animals uh, and you know hurting other kids and things like that. Um, 
I can't remember which one, but one of the more famous ones, you know, burned down his house, you know, with his parents in it or something. I mean, not, they, I don't know that they died, but, uh, you know, just doing stuff like that at nine years old, eight years old. I mean, just like crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah, right. Um, very disturbing. And I think, be, I think because it's a kid doing it, people are very prone to not want to deal with that or not wanting to confront that that is as evil behavior as it really is or something. So they'll sort of put up some kind of justification or, oh, well, it's just, you know, boys being boys or something like that. But, but psychopaths are on a whole other plane. You know, they're, they're not. Right. That's not just right. boys being boys. And what is so interesting is when they will sometimes, you know, their crimes will be in the news, like a Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh -huh. um, they will interview the sort of hapless parents who are saying we we tried everything you know you can tell they're good people mm -hmm. they don't know why they have a kid like this mm -hmm. and they tried everything um because it is a disorder it's not necessarily hereditary it's a brain dysfunction mm -hmm. um and then um the parents will sometimes get blamed and but there was really nothing they could have done except for really locking them away right. um yeah, it's rough. It's a rough go with that because it's not because also what we're saying here is that this is not a choice that the individual made, the, the psychopath. You know, it, right. they, didn't make, they didn't decide to be this way. This is mm -hmm. simply how they have always been. Mm -hmm. There, there right. wasn't a choice made in the matter. Now, the choices right. they make following that, once, they, once you learn what society's rules are and whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, but... But, but even then, it's sort of like, well, okay, but this is a person who doesn't care about mm -hmm. rules. They don't, they don't see the world the same way people who have rules do. Right. I, and you and then you also have someone who has only an external locus of control rather than an internal. Mm -hmm. So there isn't anything inside of them that's going to motivate them to want to stop because they don't have a conscience. Mm -hmm. So it's only that they're going to get busted or it's going to be found out or um, they didn't hide it well enough and now they have to find ways to hide it better um, that might motivate them to stop doing what they're doing. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. What a rough go. It is. It is a really On rough go. On everybody's and part. Rare. And, and even though it's very rare, you hear these stories because they make the news, because usually, you know, they're alarming stories. Right. Because yeah. these people are the kind of person who, uh, it doesn't bother this kind of person to cut somebody up, to, to do horrible things to people. Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't care. That's not where they're at. You know, re right. when you read interviews or listen to interviews with people who have been caught, you know, uh, mm -hmm. who were, you know, who were these kind of people, the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world. Um, they, they're just, you know, you're trying to reason with them. You're trying to, you know, the, 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 the people are trying to draw out from the person why, why, why? And it's just that mm -hmm. they can't find an answer that satisfies because this person doesn't, it's not, they're not at a parity with, with the rest of us. Right, exactly. And, you know, the other thing is, uh, what I've, I've noticed, too, when you're dealing with um, narcissists, they don't reflect back. They don't think about what's happened in the past and what they've done and or what you've done for them. Again, every day it sort of starts back at mm -hmm. square one. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't accrue data from the past um, to know whom to trust and that they can relax in someone's presence and know that that person really does like them and they don't have to keep testing their allegiance, etc. Right. Again, every day starts new. Right. Um, a psychopath reflects back to be able to fine-tune their skills. Mm -hmm. Because if it didn't work out the way they wanted in the past or they or they were about to get busted or they did get busted, they are going to try to find ways to be more clever about hiding what they do. Right. Um, or if what they were planning didn't hurt as many people as they were hoping, right, that's when they're going to reflect back. But it's to 
to continue doing what they're doing in society, which is really antisocial. Um, from what I've seen, a sociopath is almost totally in the past. Mm. Because they're holding on to everything that's happened to mm, them. Okay. Everything they didn't get and everything that they should have been able to receive and all the friends who they couldn't make and, you know, all those times that they felt left out or bullied. And it's very hard for them to think about their future being anything different than what their past has been like. And so they, I think, emotionally are, are stuck in that hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's what's making them move away from society. Okay. So, so then from what we've been talking about then, a sociopath is somebody who could potentially respond to therapy, could potentially be, you know, uh, gotten to a place where that wasn't a, a threatening or dangerous condition for them. Yeah. Anymore. I think so. If gotten oh, to I early enough or in time or something before something horrible happens like Columbine. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could do something about that. Whereas, you know, I don't know that narcissism is, I, I don't know, is this, is this a thing that's, it, it's interesting. And here's why I, here's why I have my, my, my questions about this, because I normally, I would just go, oh yeah, now, nah, whatever. They're just like <laughs> that. Right. But here's the thing. Scientology, from my own experience, inculcates narcissism. Right, it was designed by a narcissist. Uh, I mean, there's there's zero question in my mind, especially after what we've talked about today, that L. Ron Hubbard was a narcissist. Um, he, he was other things too. There was other words you could use to describe that man, but that but streaks of narcissism certainly run through his historical life story. Right? Um, no question. Yeah, but but because. Destructive cults operate the way that they do, and you know when you read Steve Hassan and you know what we've talked about before, there's a personality transfer that occurs in destructive cults, where the where the followers are trying actively to be the destructive cult leader. They're trying to take on destructive cult leader characteristics and traits, and they yeah. they they idolize this individual and they want to be more like him. And in Scientology, that's reflected in you know what would Ron do. Right, uh -huh. you know this kind of thing. You ask yourself this question: Well, here I am faced with this problem. Well, what would Ron do? And then mm. you train yourself to act and respond as Hubbard would have, rather than necessarily what you would necessarily do, because you're devaluing yourself and you're idolizing Hubbard. Right. So, mm. when in so doing that, you naturally, even with, with without thinking, you start acting in a. Um, in a narcissistic fashion, right? In other words, the whole philosophy of Scientology, I'm just going to focus on this because this is one I really know and understand so I can talk with confidence sure. about this. I'm sure there sure. are others. But with Scientology, you know, a lot of the, the whole philosophy of Scientology is centered around ego and boosting oneself, you know, achieving ultimate spiritual freedom at the detriment of your family, your friends. You'll disconnect from them in a microsecond if they threaten your ability to become a god, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, tell me that's not, you know, narcissistic, right? Yeah. So it sort of inculcates this attitude and it, and it creates it. And I have found in my own, you know, recovery process over the last couple of years, stripping away a lot, of, you know, some of these attitudes that, that I found myself with. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know. I would never have described myself that way. But but when you when I've learned about this, I've gone, oh my God, yeah, that's you know that's things I have thought, said, done uh, in my own past, and and uh -huh. come to realize that's not very constructive, not really a great way to get along in society with others because I'm not actually a narcissist. But, right. <laughs> but right. you can kind of socially become one or something. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah, right. You can parrot that behavior. It's mm -hmm. a learned behavior if that's what you're exposed to. Mm -hmm. And you also are made to feel like that's the best way to be if mm -hmm. you're you're like trying to be like someone else who is that way. Yeah. Um, and then, right, when you have a chance to strip it away, you realize actually that your true self is in there somewhere and it's not like that. Right. Um, and then you become a lot easier, I think, to, to be with but also it becomes easier for you to um, interact with people more successfully and also with much less disappointment. Um, 
because if people don't do exactly as you say right away, well, that's <laughs> life, that's you know? Right. It must be Tuesday, you know, <laughs> exactly. like, who cares, right? Uh, but right. if, you know, you're in a cult, God forbid. That's right, um, that's right. Oh, especially right. as a Sea Org member, uh, you know, which is the highest level of Scientology, right? Because you're, you're, you're indoctrinated to believe that you are superior, better, naturally more intelligent, naturally more uh, entitled, you know, as a as a member of this organization to to you know respect admiration you know that sort of thing so mm -hmm. so that's yeah. what i mean i mean it's it's not a passive thing hubbard actively indoctrinated his followers in this you know yeah i think also that the speed with which everyone has to do something you know that you you give an order and people have to rush and do it and whatever mm -hmm. that kind of the ego aggrandizement that that mm -hmm. that takes place in those moments that you know you say jump and the other people say how high mm -hmm. and um, and they're going to do it you know within a matter of minutes or else um, that can be very heady very trippy um, mm -hmm. I think it's it does happen in Scientology and it happens in almost every other cultic group too um, but to to because you know I've heard that from a lot of people who are in from a lot of different you know organizations um, where there was also the language used that we were up, we were higher beings, and everyone else who is not in it is a lower being, a lesser being. Um, already, that's making sure that there's that inherent narcissism to right. look down at everybody else. But also, usually within cultic groups, there is this. Um, jockeying for position, making sure you don't lose your standing, right? Keep up your stats, whatever you need to do, whatever the language is, mm -hmm. because you know that you're up here one day and you can be down there the next day or even on the same day. Um, and that actually is an embodiment of narcissism, that narcissists um, worry about being be beneath or below other people so they have to be above other people okay. they're not ever eye to eye face to face um on par um because that's too risky because they could slip too easily so they have to be way up here so mm -hmm. they they don't worry about being down here so within cults most people are not like this you're either above you're seen as above or you then have to worry about or you're sent kind of to a lower ranking or you lose your you know your ranking for whatever reason and so it's a lot of that sort of moving up and down and up and down um, that makes you feel i think usually when you're down you really suffer and so finally when you make it back up you feel special again and you kind of like the status and you can go right back into the narcissism right. um, and and so it plays on your emotions uh you know back and forth and back and forth but so i guess we're i guess we're talking really there and then about an acquired narcissism versus a, a born or natural narcissism and when we talk about treating this or doing something about this, where you know when you're recovering from a destructive cult experience, for example, you can come out of that headspace, come out of that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But a real narcissist, a real narcissist—I mean, like the the guy who didn't have to destroy its destructive cult to become that—that mm -hmm. that person isn't. You've had people like that in your office. Mm -hmm. Do they change? Can can you get them out of that? Do you have has anybody ever like? Not usually. You know, cored out the like <laughs> evil little bit in the middle of that or whatever that 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 makes that what it is. Um. What I have seen at most is the willingness to do some behavior modification because they can see that they are um, not able to sustain a relationship and they really do want to because they want to be with someone even though they might want that person because they want to control them. Um, but that they, their behavior when they sort of become controlling and when they let their narcissism really show, they'll sometimes scare people away and then they find themselves alone, which they do not want. Narcissists um, are terrified 
of um, being abandoned, mm. even though they will push people away. Uh, okay. and, and if you leave them, you are the one who is abandoning them for no reason. Right. Right. Even no, it's always on you. It's always on always you. On you. Right. right. And usually they will know who to zero in on. It'll be someone who's what they call an empath, someone who is a thoughtful, kind, forgiving, mm-hmm. loving person who will put up with their crap mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, for way too long. Right. So by the right. time they're leaving, it's because they probably should have left like nine years before that, right. um, but they're finally leaving and the narcissist will tell them that they're abandoning them for no reason. Right. Um, and that is their biggest fear, you know, being abandoned. So they will need to have people in their life. And if they find that they keep pushing people away, sometimes that will be the, the impetus for them to come into therapy. And they still might not be able to give over or, or just kind of to admit that they have this need and that they're insecure or whatever because that's putting them in a way too emotionally vulnerable place. But they just might say, sort of teach me how to do it differently, like teach me how to shift my behavior, not my thoughts, not my needs, right? Mm -hmm. But my behavior so that I can have a relationship. That's sort of... That's about the best you've got. That I've got, right. Yeah, okay. Well, that actually leads me to my last point on this, which is... um, and that's interesting what you just said about narcissism, actually, because, um, you know, don't want to be believed. Don't, you know, a fear of abandonment is actually, I would imagine, quite the opposite from a psychopath who could care less oh, yeah. whether somebody's around him or not, you know. Yeah, no, they don't care. But, yeah. No, not at all. And you also brought up something that I wanted to make sure to respond to when you were saying mm-hmm. a learned narcissism. Mm. There are diagnoses that are learned diagnoses, not everyone, and certainly um, there are some that you just cannot learn. They are or they aren't, like if it's a, a structural brain issue. But there are some that are absolutely situational. Okay. Like you can have situational depression. It means that you don't have necessarily clinical depression. It's not something that is hereditary. It's not something you're necessarily prone to. But you were in a horrible situation or you lived through wartime or you've gone through a lot of trauma and you have situational depression. You can have situational narcissism. Um, it's, it's a learned way of operating. It's a learned way of feeling about yourself and having expectations of others. Um, very similar to a woman I talked to recently who was raised um, by um, a group that believed in Aryan pride. Mm. Um, and so she was raised to be a racist. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are these videos of her, you know, saying horrible things and doing horrible things. And, you know, um, and now that she's left it, it's very similar to what you were saying about you. Like, this is not your true self. Mm -hmm. You can feel like this is really your true self and you are absolutely this way until you leave the situation and find out that this was something kind of imposed upon you, but isn't really who you are. Okay, good. Good. Well, on this last point, I wanted to, um, you know, talk about the fact that, uh, you know, if, if somebody recognizes these these symptoms, these 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 manifestations in their friend, family, partner, or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, it seems to me that you know the most immediate and effective solution for them is run, don't walk, away from that situation by any means necessary, because they're, you know, you're not in a situation. It seems to me where you're going to change this person by talking nicely with them, appeasing them, doing what they want. These, these are very, very uh, destructive relationship partners for mm-hmm. people who aren't that way. I mean, if you're not a psychopath or a narcissist, you, th- these are not people you should be connected to. And it, and it seems, I, you know, I guess I, 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 my advice would be get out now, whatever it yeah. takes, get out, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. That, um, is that right? I mean... Yeah, make a beeline. Yeah, yeah. like like yeah. whatever it takes, you know. 
Right. Split the and bank account today. Get out, you know, sort of thing. Today, call a friend. If you don't feel strong enough to do it on your own, get help. Find someone who can help you, who can empower you mm -hmm. to take those steps. Um, what a narcissist will do, unfortunately, is that if they feel like you're itching to leave, um, they'll play a couple different cards. And mm -hmm. you want to watch out for these. Um, and this is actually one of the ways that you're going to really be able to tell that you're with a narcissist and you need to find the nearest exit. Mm -hmm. um, one is that they will tell you that you're never going to find anyone as good as them and you're never going to find anyone who's going to love you or even like you in the same way that they do and they're going to make you feel that there are no other choices for you. Right. Right? right. Leave the room. Leave the house. Um, the next thing is that if they then try to tell you that you um, will never be able to be rid of them, that they will find you, that they will find a way. Usually, if you, also, if you have kids together, they will do um, a lot of parental alienation. They will make you look like the bad parent. They'll bring you up trumped up charges so they can get custody. They'll take control of all the money. Um, and so they, they've already been taking control along the way and assuring their ability to maintain control over everything and having you lose yours. But the, the other thing that is a red flag is that if the intimidation and um, the kind of control mechanisms and the emotional abuse stop working to keep you in line, they'll then try to make you feel guilty. And they'll try to tap into your heartstrings. Um, by telling you a sob story about themselves, that um, they were abandoned or they were never really loved and you are the only one who could do this for them and don't abandon them like everyone else has, et cetera, et cetera. That actually does work on some people um, mm -hmm. because suddenly they see this softer side and they think this person is turning around and really becoming mm -hmm. kinder and it's all just another ploy. Right. Um, and then you still want to find the nearest exit. Yeah, exactly. Now, just run, don't walk. Yeah. Okay. Right. I just wanted to kind of put that there in concrete terms because yeah, I don't think no, it's, it's really, right. you know, it's really important. Said often enough, get out. Yeah. You know, just right, get out. Right, because you, you as the one who is the empathic one, you will be slowly dying in that relationship. That's right. That's right. You're That's not going to change them. No. That's not what's going to happen. You know, and with a psychopath, it is. It is just physically impossible to do that. You're not going to perform brain surgery on the person. Right, right. You know what I mean? It's not going to happen. Right. No. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, fascinating stuff. Um, you know, I'm glad we took some time to sort of delineate this a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, get a bit more accuracy with these, with these words, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, been going on for a long time. I mean, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho. I mean, this is, this is just, you know, common parlance, but... I think yeah. uh, I think it always helps to understand these terms better and and understand who's in our environment. Really, the the real important point about this is not the words; it's it's what's going on around us, and you know exactly. what are we dealing with, and how do we deal with it? How do we recognize it? How do we deal with deal with it? You know. So anyway, thanks a lot for. You're welcome. Thank doing you. This. Yeah, this is really good, and yeah. uh, we will talk again soon. And that concludes our interview with Rachel. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, I would very much like to hear your comments on this, your feedback on this. What did you think about what Rachel was saying? What has been your experience with this sort of thing? And what's worked for you and what hasn't? Um, if you've brushed up against narcissism in relationships you've had or with bosses, you know, employees, friends, family, uh, how have you dealt with it? If you've, you know, had a psychopath in your life, what happened? Let me know. I'd like to hear. Uh, leave it in the comments section of my YouTube channel or on the comments section of the sensiblyspeaking.com website. And, uh, and I would love to hear from you guys. Also, with uh, Christmas now upon us, I just wanted to put a quick plug in for my critical merchandise, uh, which is available at shop.spreadshirt.com slash Chris Shelton. Uh, got all kinds of wonderful merchandise there, and consider giving some of that as a holiday gift uh, to yourself or to others 
because I think there's nothing better than spreading the, the joy of logic and reason and critical thinking, as well as some of the humorous stuff I've also put up there. So thank you very much for coming around. I really appreciate you guys uh, coming and listening to this podcast, and I will see you or you'll hear me again next week. Bye-bye.